Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Um, we have a excellent topic today. We're going to talk about the role of an advocate in safety planning. I know um, a lot of you have had a lot of questions about this, and this has been a pretty um, frequently asked about um, topic for us to cover. So let's get into some of the, the fun housekeeping um, parts of the webinar. Uh, first off, we'd uh, love to thank the Office of Violence Against Women for funding these webinars and helping us do the work that we do. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay. And so now we're going to go over your control panel. So if you um, look, sometimes it's on the left and sometimes it's on the right of your screen. Um, if you see this entire um, expanded um, control panel, great. If you don't and you only see the the small four button um, dark gray panel, go ahead and click that um, orange arrow there and that will either expand it or retract the control panel, okay? Next, um, we do have a raise your hand um, option. So we will be using this when Sam or I um, ask a question, like, you know, how many of us love webinars? <laughs> um, and then you can click um, that and then we can get a little, little uh little poll of, of that <laughs> and then the most important thing that we are going to use throughout this webinar is this little question box down here so um, i would love for all of you to type in um, that question box tell me where you're from um, are you an advocate are you law enforcement um, yeah tell me where you're from and what you do and of course, if you don't see that little question box, make sure that your control panel is expanded. All right, we got a couple of folks. Ooh. All right, I have some folks from Ogden. That's where I um, currently am right now. Yeah, a bunch of folks from Weaver County, um, folks from Sandy. We got folks from the southwest uh, corner of Utah. And we got some victim advocates down there. Ooh, we got a couple social workers. Yay, someone from um, Alabama. I always love to see folks from different states here. It's really, it's really quite exciting. Um, let's see. Dang, we have a we have some MSWs here. Gosh, folks from Salt Lake. Cool. We have a a pretty cool mix um, of folks so far. Thank you everyone for um, doing that. Um, and we will be utilizing that throughout um, the rest of today's webinar. Thank you. All right, and I know many of you love CEUs, although I would love to believe that you were here for just me and just Sam, um, but I know CEUs play um, maybe a major role in this too. So yes, we do have CEUs available for this. You will get a link um, in your email after the webinar. Um, go ahead and fill that out and you um, just need to get at least 70% on it um, and then I will um, email you um, that CEU certificate personally. All right, so who is the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition? So UDVC is the federally recognized state anti-domestic violence coalition for the state of Utah. Okay. So what we do is we support, we train, we provide technical assistance um, for folks who work directly um, with victims of domestic and sexual violence. So currently we have 15 um, domestic violence service providers throughout the state of Utah. Um, and the, the training and the, the, the programming that we offer at the coalition um, was created by, you know, not only us here at the coalition, but the actual um, boots on the ground that the service providers um, have been a, a major um, part in developing this curriculum. So we do um, love to thank everyone that um, is a part of this and a part of the, the, the um, community um, that we have in Utah. All right, so um, here's a little bit about me. You'll hear from me um, a little bit throughout this uh, presentation. Um, most of you have probably seen this slide, gosh, more times than you can remember, right? 
So I'm Andy Tremonti. I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator for the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition. I have an educational history in psychology and women and gender studies, which seems to go pretty hand in hand with what we're talking about. I have about eight years, um, going on nine years, of working with LGBTQIA and other underserved survivors um, of all forms of trauma. Um, about half with youth and half with adults. The picture on the left here is a picture of little Dungeons and Dragons figures. Um, this is what I do for my self-care. Um, it's really important, especially as advocates. Um, the stuff that we, we deal with, the things that we hear, that we experience, um, can be really taxing on us. And it's really important for us to take care of ourselves. So that's one of my, my self-cares there. And of course, the one, the picture on the right are my cats, Jorge and Totico. And gosh, who doesn't love cats or dogs or animals, right? They're great, really great. Oh, last but not least, I live in Ogden. <laughs> we are very close to the mountains. Um, I love to hike, I love to get outdoors. Um, really great way to de-stress and it's awesome. It's really great, so I do love that. All right, so now I'm going to turn the time over um, to Sam. All right, just trying to figure out my uh, muted settings there. So, <clears throat> okay, cool. I'm excited to um, join you all and, and help present on this topic of you know the role of an advocate in safety planning. Um, Andy went through all of this super fun stuff. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about me here. Um, so I'm Sam Candland. Um, I am the volunteer coordinator for the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition. Uh, the name, in my opinion, is a little misleading. Most of the work that I do revolves around managing, recruiting for, um, taking calls on the statewide domestic violence crisis hotline called the Link Line. So chances are if you, you know, email in to UDVC looking for some some safety planning, some work with one-on-one um, -on -one individuals who are in need of assistance. Uh, the, the, the emails, the phone calls, they're likely going to be forwarded to me because that's kind of my ballpark. Um, I do have, as far as background goes, I have my associates in sociology. And as of last Friday, I just finished my bachelor's in social work, finally. Um, so that, that's pretty cool. I'm looking to work towards my MSW at this point. Um, in the future. Um, and then, yeah, as far as interests, uh, you know, volunteering, I started out with the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition as a crisis hotline volunteer back in, I don't know, January of 2016, I believe. Um, and I just kind of got sucked in. Um, and then now that I'm done with school, I'm looking to get back into volunteering with different groups and organizations. So if anybody knows anything, let me know. Um, I really enjoy hanging out with the family. I'm a, I'm a bit of a homebody um kind of just low-key mellow i have a really close relationship with my uh immediate family so that that's been good um and i have an obsession with my pupper ruby over here on the right hand side um she is the love of my life i don't know what i would do without her and i can assure you she is an absolute celebrity around the utah domestic violence coalition office um i think i think a lot of people <laughs> tend to like her she's a pretty cute dog um, so yeah, if for some reason you want to know more about me after the webinar, feel free to reach out um, and we can talk about that. But for now, let's talk more about some safety planning here. Um, and what is a safety plan? Because I think a lot of the time, at least when I started doing this work um, and when I started as a volunteer, I didn't quite understand the concept of, of a safety plan. I, it felt very rigid. It felt very um, forced almost. Um, it was almost intimidating to me um, trying to utilize it in the beginning um, and knowing that with every call I have to make sure that I talk about a safety plan and I talk about, you know, we're going into a safety plan and we come away with an absolute like written rule or guideline or whatever with a safety plan that every caller can can take away into, you know, into their life and, and, and utilize. And, and I've learned in doing this work that it's a lot more loose than, than the rigid jumping into a safety plan sometimes. So sometimes people do call in and say, hey, I want a safety plan. Somebody told me to call and get a safety plan with you guys. Uh, let's do that. And that's totally fine. Um, but most of the time I've noticed that safety planning really comes naturally with the conversation and it's, it's more fluid than, um, 
than I once thought it was. So just as far as the definition of a safety plan goes, um, a safety plan is a personalized practical plan that includes ways to remain safe while in a relationship, planning to leave, or after the survivor leaves. Safety planning involves assisting the survivor on how to cope with emotions, tell friends and family about the abuse, take legal action, and more. I mean, it's really, it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive plan to just cover the bases. Our goal as advocates, our goal as social workers, our goal as anybody invested in helping victims of violence, um, our, our number one goal is to keep people as safe as possible in whatever situation they're choosing to be in. And, I, and, and I'll go back to that topic a little bit, um, but noting that, again, it's their life, it's what they want, uh, whatever they're looking for, that's fantastic. Let's figure out how to keep you safe, whatever that looks like, okay? So, and, and noting too that safety planning, it's not just for survivors. Uh, it's not something that um, is only utilized when, when you have a survivor call in or enter your office or something like that. No, I mean, it's primarily, at least on the hotline, when we're dealing with safety planning for survivors. Um, but oftentimes, I'm safety planning with family members. I have many people calling in and saying, hey, I've got my sister in this situation, or hey, my dad's being abused by my brother. What can I do? Um, and, and noting to them, because I think that it's important to note that, that they do need safety in their own lives. I've had callers call in and say, hey, you know, things are getting to the point where I feel like the increase of, of violence and the danger might now impact me. And, and, and what does that look like? Is it okay if I take a step back? Am I being a bad friend if I take a step back? Um, and, and, and really kind of navigating those difficult emotions that, that family members or friends or whoever are, um, are really trying to you know navigate or even just giving them safety planning ideas for the survivor in the situation they're calling in and saying hey i want a list of um of things to do to to help this person uh what what can i do what can i take away what can i give them as far as like a checklist of things to think about and that's totally fine it doesn't necessarily have to be safety planning with the family member for the family member it could be safety planning with the family and friends uh, for the survivor um coworkers we get coworkers calling into the hotline um, and I, I talk about this in, in other presentations, but I think that coworkers are really an underutilized resource. Um, if you're fortunate enough to be in a domestic violence situation where you're allowed to have a job, um, you're oftentimes spending, you know, 20, 30, 40 hours a week with people who who tend to get you know get to know you pretty intimately. I don't know how many of you have followed along um, with the with the Susan Powell story and and the Cold Podcast in particular, but they really go into talking about how Susan had created different um, techniques or safety planning ideas or connections with her coworkers. So they knew if something were to happen to her, this is where they can find this information and they should get this to the police and this is who they should inform. Um, and it was a way to keep all of that information away from Josh Powell, who was very invasive and controlling the dynamics of their relationship. I mean, also really, uh, safety planning with with anybody, really anybody calling in, doctors, clergy, social workers, and other professionals. Um, I'll tell you that, that for the social workers that are on the um, webinar here, you all are definitely uh, really invested in safety planning. Those can be some very difficult calls, but I appreciate them because I can understand how thorough you are trying to be at your job and making sure that you're ensuring the safety of your of your client. It's, I mean, I absolutely appreciate it. Um, but it, but yeah, you can absolutely call in. I I'm very uh, proactive in advocating for anybody to call into the hotline, not just the survivors. Um, most people think that um, we're like a counseling service, but safety planning and getting different ideas and bouncing um, different thoughts off of each other to make sure a unique individuals. Uh, situation is at maximum safety is super important. And I mean, I call I call different hotlines if I'm stumped, you know, the human trafficking hotline, the um, suicide prevention hotline, whatever. If I feel like I need somebody with a different idea, I'll reach out. So please, I encourage you all to do so. Um, yeah, doctors calling in asking about things like mandatory reporting and, and how do I go about that and how do I keep this person safe? Um, yeah, the very first call I ever took was from a bishop trying to help a woman in his ward in an elder abuse case. And so, like I said, I mean, anybody can call in and you can do a safety plan with anybody. Um, and it's, I mean, it's really, it's it's better to be safe than sorry, you know, like in, in all of this stuff. Um, so, yeah, don't be intimidated. Uh, call in if you need to and, and know that you can, in any situation with anybody you're interacting with, 
for um, a survivor's scenario, you can give them tips, you can give them ideas as to how to be safe for not only for themselves, but, but for the individual specifically dealing with the abuse. Um, some traits of an effective safety plan here. It's created in collaboration. Um, I know that for, for me at least, I know that I, I tend to feel like I'm, you know, I have, I have somewhat of an expertise understanding of domestic violence and the dynamics and, and all those things. Um, but if I'm completely omitting the survivor or the caller or whoever from the conversation and I'm just using my my ideas from what I know about past situations, it's not gonna work. Every situation, everything that everybody's going through, um, even if it's similar in nature to other conversations you've had with other individuals, uh, it's, it's, it's unique. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're including the individual specifically that we're, we're engaging with in the conversation and knowing that, uh, that, yeah, we absolutely have some great ideas, uh, but they are experts in their situation, and we want to make sure that we're including that um, expertise that they have uh, to get the best possible safety plan. Um, it's survivor-centered, and this can be, I mean, this can be secondary survivors as well, but uh, we want to meet the survivors where they are and not where we want them to be. I know that a lot of the times, um, and I'm because I've taken hundreds of, hundreds of calls, um, I know that I have ideas about, again, that, that I know what abuse looks like. I know where things can, get, can go. I've, you know, I've read the statistics. I know all that stuff. Um, but a, if a survivor is not ready to leave, if they're not ready to take an action, if they're not ready to do something, that's their choice. That's their life. Um, we can absolutely warn them about the, the, the dangers, potentially, the pros and cons of a situation, of course. But we don't want to push them into doing something. I know that a lot of the times we get this idea that uh, shelter, you know, shelter, getting people into shelter when they're high danger um, and, you know, risk for lethality is the best idea. But we also know, to, statistically speaking, that 75% of the homicides occur after somebody has left a situation. So, you know, what really is safest for the person? Uh, we, we need to have that conversation with them. Um, it's helpful in any stage of the relationship. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the stages of change, but um, it can be anything from people being, you know, curious about what are my options? Is this abuse? I don't know what's going on and being sort of inquisitive to, you know, wanting to take some, you know, some preparation like, okay, so I, I think that I might want to leave. What, what documents do I need to take with, with me? What do I need to um, plan for as far as getting into shelter, stuff like that. Um, people in the action phase of the stages of change, they're ready to go. They need to get into shelter. They have left um, and, they're, and they're looking for other support services. And then also in that maintenance phase of, you know, you get people, I've had people call in that have maybe been, you know, without the relationship, the abusive relationship for, you know, two, three months, something like that. And they're calling in and saying, hey, look, I just need to talk to somebody right now. I need to be safe right now on a phone call because if I don't call you, I'm going to call them and I need to stay safe. And that's fine. I mean, we can safety plan on how to, you know, how to stay safe for the next hour in whatever situation. That's, that's absolutely fine. But we're, we're going to be planning for all different levels and all different places that somebody's in in a relationship. It's not one set. Oh, you've taken action. Now we can safety plan. No, safety is going to be you know, all across the board in these situations. Um, it meets the needs important to the survivor. That's super important. I know that again, understanding that um, I know different options um, and, and possibilities for people who are trying to exit a relationship or trying to stay safe or whatever. But if I'm, you know, super focused on trying to get this person into shelter, when the primary point of the call is to figure out how to get a protective order. I'm completely disregarding what the, what the caller wants. I'm completely disregarding the fact that um, maybe they are safe where they're at. Maybe, maybe they don't need to leave in a shelter. And I'm taking my assumptions and, and, and putting those on the survivor. And so we wanna just make sure we focus on, even if we could, we, I mean, and later we could plug different ideas of, hey, you mentioned this, maybe let's talk about safety around you know, this situation, but, as far as the interactions and the engagements, we really want to focus on what the what the caller or what the survivor is looking to focus on at that moment in time. Um, we want to empower the survivor to stay safe. Again, we want to keep people as safe as possible in whatever situation they're choosing to be in. And I would think that across the board with anybody who's on this phone call or working in this field, um, we're, we're very much so, particularly with the UDVC, um, in the business of empowerment. We want to empower people to make choices for themselves. Um, 
if you're familiar with the power and control wheel, which I'm assuming most of you are, um, we know that the power and control wheel is based on this idea of somebody taking that empowerment away from a survivor of domestic violence. And so what we want to do is introduce the idea of empowerment back to people. A lot of the times I get people calling in and saying, will you please just tell me what to do? I just need to know where to go. I, you know it's best. You're supposed to be an expert in this. You know, tell me what to do. And it's just not appropriate to do that. Um, and so I really like to turn it back on the callers and say, well, what do you want to do? I mean, what are you looking to do? And then from there, having them identify their own needs and then offering suggestions or solutions potentially that could be of benefit to them. I know people will say, you know, yeah, just tell me what to do. And I say, well, you know, it's not necessarily what you should do, but I've heard of people doing this and it turning out this way. I've also heard of people doing this and it turning out this way. So you should decide, you know, what, what feels safest for you? What do you think is the best for you in this situation? And just giving them, forcing it sometimes it feels like, but giving them back that, that empowerment and that ability to choose uh, is going to be is very crucial to uh, not only their safety, but their, their healing process and uh, gaining a sense of self-confidence later on uh, throughout this whole process. And then we want to, for, for this, it prepares the survivors for many different scenarios. Uh, we, want, we don't want to overwhelm people who are potentially already overwhelmed and, you know, dealing with trauma brain and in crisis mode. But we do want to offer some different ideas around what, what could this look like? Again, so we have people calling in, for example, on the hotline saying, what's going to happen if I get a protective order? Okay, I mean, that's a valid question. Um, what could potentially happen? You know, these are these are some of the pros and cons that if you get a protective order, I mean, you're going to have to go to court and um, there's not necessarily the, the criminal repercussions at first, you know, you're talking about those things. And then also talking about, well, if you don't get a protective order, that's fine because maybe they're scared of, you know, instigating future violence with, with an order of protection. Um, but these are maybe some of the limitations or the restrictions to not getting a protective order. And again, just navigating around the what ifs of, of the inquiries that people are asking about. Um, in order to give them a better scope of what their situation might look like. Um, <clears throat> when should we safety plan? I mean, really, I always think when, when, I, when it pops up on this slide that I just want to take it out and put in like big red letters, always, just always, and <laughs> anytime, anywhere. Um, but really, when a survivor is ready to leave, again, going into the stages of change, we want to think about that. Um, when a survivor is staying with their abusive partner, uh, because a lot of the time, if they're dealing with particularly I mean, any type of violence, but physical violence, we want to make sure that they're prepared to protect themselves uh, in, in certain scenarios. Um, when we're concerned for the safety and the well-being of the survivor, um, their family, their friends, their children, um, just when we, when we think it's appropriate, uh, with family members, coworkers, and friends of the survivor. Um, anytime anybody's interacting with you and saying, hey, what can I do? How can I help? Uh, how can I keep myself safe when helping? Um, it's it's definitely important. And then with professionals working with survivors, it's it's something that again I encourage people to call in um, and just have these conversations and have this dialogue with people who maybe are thinking of things from a different viewpoint or have a different understanding of a situation um, in order to help you know troubleshoot and brainstorm a scenario. Um, to to keep people you know across the state in in every city as safe as possible um, so as far as this goes how to begin a safety plan with all of this we're going to be listening hopefully we're all listening to, to the survivor or whoever we're interacting with but we want to listen to the survivor's experience um, because again they're going to tell you different um, maybe red flags or keywords or or things that might advise you as an advocate against suggesting or bringing up a certain idea or topic. Um, so for, for example, again, if you think that um, the individual is maybe trying to get like, um, or if they've thought about a protective order, but they know that the person has um, threatened their life if they ever get a protective order against them and they know that they can find them at their home, maybe this person needs to think about, um, also thinking about as far as safety goes, um, moving or getting into a shelter before trying to get a protective order, you know, things like that. Um, so we're, we're, being, we're able to pick up on things that maybe they hadn't uh, thought about in their own situation. We want to provide just various options and, and think about it, different ideas and ask those 
um, questions that help uh, stimulate the survivor into thinking, you know, about the, the various scenarios in their own life um, to help generate new ideas. We want to tailor to meet the needs of the survivor in that moment. Um, I mean, and we might, might know that, um, for example, you have somebody who's just in this sort of like contemplation phase. They call in or they, they, they approach you in your office and say, hey, you know, is this abuse? Um, is this what's what's happening to me? And is this is this wrong? Am I overthinking it or whatever? Um, <clears throat> and they then go into you know ex detail, extremely graphic levels of, of abuse. I know I have to, I've had people call in who are saying I don't really know if I'm being you know if I'm being abused. And then it turns out they've been you know strangled multiple times, and they're just completely overlooking that as as a red flag. Um, in those moments when they're in a vulnerable state, when they're not understanding if they're being abused, um, we maybe don't want to bombard them with um, overwhelming actions um, in, in the beginning. We maybe don't want to say, you need to call the police right now, or um, you need to get a protective order, or you need to get you know shelter, or whatever. We want to think, um, maybe let's talk about what the dynamics of abuse look like. Let's talk about the power control wheel. Let's talk about your situation, and then help the survivor um, reflect upon that and help them piece those pieces together themselves rather than telling them what they're going through. I mean, and, and again, not jumping the gun because all of these situations, they're difficult, they're traumatic, they're, they're hard to do. And when, when you're talking to someone who's just discovering that they're, yeah, you know, they're being abused, it's gonna take maybe some time to settle in and some time to, to work with them in the future. Um, so again, yeah, meeting the, the survivor where they're at and what their needs are in that moment. Um, and then listen to the survivor again. They're the experts and their own abusive partner. Um, just going back to the idea of if they think it's not safe to leave, if they think that they should stay in this relationship um, or they should stay in a home, at least, whatever, uh, because they're afraid of being killed, uh, take that seriously. Uh, we know that there are you know, precautions as far as uh, DVSPs having, you know, confidential addresses and, uh, you know, things like that, these security cameras, you know, the person having interaction with the police and stuff, you know, but, but we also know how some of those with, even with all of those um, preventative measures in place that terrible things can still happen. Uh, so we want to trust the survivor. We want to believe them um, and, and meet them where, where they are in the moment. Okay. Um, as far as the process of a safety plan, um, we're just going to, I mean, we're assessing the situation that how I started out, at least on the hotline is that people call in and say, Hey, you know, I need to talk to somebody about this. I need to, um, get some ideas around what I should do. Um, and I said, yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, can you tell me a little more about your situation, um, or whatever you're comfortable with? Um, and then from there, it allows them to maybe tell me, you know, smaller amounts of details versus, you know, sometimes people are, you know, they absolutely just fill their guts because they need to get it all out. Um, but with that, with the information we give, we get from the, the person that we're interacting with, uh, we just want to, we want to assess it. We want to, again, pay attention to the red flags, talking about things like if they mention it's their ex-partner or if they've been strangled or if they're being stalked, things that we know are, are key red flags to potential lethality, we, we want to focus on those things. Um, and just overall assess like what's what's going on in the dynamics of the situation. Um, we want to focus on their strengths, and we want to focus potentially on the strengths of our organizations to be able to assist people. Um, when when we talk about strengths, I think that a lot of the time that people think only you know like resiliency and and bravery and calling in and and all those things, which are absolutely absolutely valuable things and and things to point out to. Um, a vulnerable survivor who's who's looking out for uh, resources and and could use maybe a boost of self confidence and and helping to feel you know not worthless or whatever. But strengths can also be having a car. That's a huge strength. Um, having a cell phone that isn't being you know tapped or watched. Um, having family supports near you. Uh, those types of things. I mean, and thinking in your own organizations. I know that as far as the domestic violence service providers go. Um, all of them are independently ran. And so each service provider might have different strengths within their organization that maybe someone in a different county doesn't have. For example, I know that when I when having conversations with um, both the YWCA and South Valley Sanctuary around burner phones, um, the YWCA has been, based on their grant and, and, and you know and how they get the phones, 
it's a little more restrictive and they hadn't, in the, at least when I had talked to them, hadn't been able to just, you know, distribute them freely to whoever, whereas the rules around the burner phones for South Valley Sanctuary uh, were loose, or they were much more loose, and they were able to basically say, if we run out of phones, we'll just get more phones. Um, so thinking about that, like what key things that, that you know of in your organization can be of benefit, um, or other things in other organizations that you know of could be of benefit. Um, so yeah, focusing on the strengths of, of everybody involved. Um, you want to identify the immediate and future risks to safety. Um, and this isn't necessarily thinking about what's going to be a risk in five years, but this could be, you know, what's a risk in five days? Like, what are you going to have to face if you if you do pursue that protective order, if you do decide you want to leave um, the, the home, if you do decide that, um, you know, some people want to get, you know, like couples therapy and different things, like what, what could be the risks around that or what could be, uh, the, the you know, the positive things around that. You want to ask the survivor what strategies they've tried in the past around safety. Um, and this is something, I mean, we know the, the, the cycle of how this goes, that it takes a person on average seven times to leave an abusive relationship. Um, some people maybe leave on the first time, some people maybe leave on the 17th time. I mean, it's, it's, there's not really one set amount that you need to hit before you can leave. Um, but with that, we know that if people on average have tried to leave seven times before, then there are seven attempts with seven, you know, seven different stories and ideas and options that they've already experienced and already tried out that could be super beneficial that worked for them um, or things that, that didn't work for them. You know, for example, they, they tried to leave and they were saving up money and um, they were hiding the money under the mattress and then the person found the mattress the money under the mattress. And so then they had to start from square one with the money. Okay, cool. So you still have maybe a resource or a source to, to get the money, let's think about maybe a different hiding spot, you know, things like that, that, um, that can be of benefit that were maybe just reworking ideas that they've already gone through um, and, and situations they've already experienced. And again, we want to provide an array of options. We don't want to overwhelm too many people. Um, if, if they're in crisis mode, usually keep it, you know, straight to the point and not necessarily, you know, give seven different tangents of what could happen. Um, but some people calling in, I know there's a hotline <laughs> that I'll have, you know, conversations with people who want every single resource that I can find in the county that they're calling from. And, and that's absolutely fine. Um, some people are more, you know, in a, a better prepared in the mental state to, to have that more uh, elongated or engaged conversation. And so just, yeah, just knowing, assessing the situation, seeing where they're at, you know, mentally, emotionally and stuff. And, uh, and at least letting them know that there are options, even if it's just an option, you know, between they choose to stay or they choose to leave. Uh, we just want to let them know that they have a choice and whatever they do, that's their choice. And we want to keep them safe with that choice. Okay. All right. So when we get into this section, I'm going to ask for a little more engagement through that um, text box that Andy was talking about earlier and that you all typed into. Um, and we're going to go for plans for all different types of stages. Um, just to preface this, this is not, you know, a comprehensive list of safety planning techniques. You can Google safety planning techniques for so many different situations. I know I do. Um, when you're safety planning, you know, people who are being, you know, trafficked, safety planning with um, people who are, you know, immigrants or refugees, different things in different uh, situations are going to warrant different ideas around safety planning. Um, but these are some of the things that I know that I've talked about on a hotline. These are some of the things that I know that people in our uh, link line volunteer trainings have, have suggested potentially. And I want to hear from you all. I want to know when we're going through each of these topics, what ideas around safety planning you might have that, that I don't have on here. Um, and, and also, again, knowing that, please feel free to Google different um, safety planning tips because there are so many resources out there um, that you're never ever going to have a comprehensive list and that's great. This is a great thing to just keep building upon and building upon. Okay. So let's start with safety in the home. Um, some things to think about. You want to consider safer places in the home to go to when an incident of violence is about to occur. Um, we have people who say that you know, when, and I've had callers that are saying, you know, that when they get in a fight, they go lock themselves in the bathroom or they do whatever. Um, we don't, we want to maybe encourage people to stay away from the bathroom. Um, there are a lot of hard services in there uh, that they can be, you know, subjected to physical damage from. Um, maybe avoiding the kitchen is, is a good idea. There are a lot of knives. There are a lot of sharp objects in there. There, again, there are not a lot of soft surfaces in a kitchen usually. 
um, that we that could be a place where people get more damage to physical self um, if if that's about to occur. Um, we want to avoid the stairs. Um, it's it's really unfortunate how many calls I've had where people have discussed that they made the mistake, as they had put it, of going near or trying to leave and going by the stairs and their abusive partner caught them and continued to throw them down the stairs and drag them back up and throw them down the stairs again and drag them back up, uh, which has resulted in, you know, traumatic brain injuries and different things. Um, you know, if the person has a den or a gun room or something like that, probably don't suggest that they go to the den or the gun room. Um, we don't want to put people in a more vulnerable state by just trying to exit a situation. Again, thinking about places where there are soft surfaces, where they're not going to receive, you know, a, a, at least a, a greater, there, there's a less risk, I guess, of re receiving a substantial amount of physical damage if an incident is about to occur. Um, and avoiding areas where the children are during incidents. Um, I know, in, you know, in the heated moment, people might try to lock themselves um, in, in the kid's bedroom, or they might try to run to the living room where the kids are playing or whatever. Not only is that, um, you know, potentially physically dangerous for the child in that moment, um, and, and potentially, you know, more physically dangerous for the, you know, the victim in that moment, but also thinking about, I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the ACE study and knowing the adverse childhood experiences and children witnessing, witnessing violence um, will have an effect on them, it will impact them. And we don't want to subject any, anybody to that if we can avoid it. Um, we want to plan an escape route. Um, something to think about, again, I mean, maybe they know that they don't have the option to leave through the front door because the abuser or, or whoever, I mean, just the family, you know, at a, at a previous date had installed one of those like security cameras or, you know, doorbell security camera things so that the person can leave them or see them leave um, and monitor them uh, and know that they've escaped. Maybe thinking about is it safer to leave through a back door? Um, is it safer to leave um, when the person is in the shower? Um, do you need to go to the basement and crawl out a window? Uh, things around that and, and things to think about uh, as far as, as getting potentially creative with, with how people need to escape or leave a situation. And I, I mean, I think that I joke in sometimes when I, when I talk to my volunteers about, uh, you know, sometimes you need to get a little 007 about like sneaking around and and getting out of, of the situation that you're in. But but really though, uh, sometimes you really need to think outside of the box to, to get people out of these uh, abusive situations. If that means, you know, the person's in the shower or the person ran, you know, went to the bathroom and you need to run out the back door and hop the fence um, into your neighbor's yard, maybe that's something that you need to do if that's gonna keep you, you know, if that's the only way to get out and that's something that you are, are, are thinking about. Um, memorizing important phone numbers is a big one. I know that, uh, that, I mean, that seems pretty obvious, but think about this. Think about this in terms of dealing with maybe immigrants or refugees or people who don't speak English or people who, who just maybe aren't from the United States. 911 is not 911 across the world. You know, it's, it's, there are different numbers. And so just having those conversations with people and just saying, do you know, this is, and this is how you call, contact the police and calling 911 or whatever. And this could be things like memorizing important phone numbers, such as, you know, your family and friends, or maybe your work phone number, or maybe uh, your children's school, or a specific victim advocate, or whatever, you know, but, but knowing to memorize different people in different places that are going to be of assistance in, you know, throughout this process. Um, you want to avoid clothing that can be used to harm the survivor. Uh, thinking about having conversations with people, if they're, you know, continuously being strangled, uh, maybe they shouldn't wear scarves or necklaces. Um, if they think that um, they, you know, the earrings and stuff could get ripped out, maybe don't wear earrings for a while. Um, thinking about different, you know, like pieces of jewelry, thinking about um, switching to flats instead of wearing high heels, uh, things like that that are going to maybe potentially help somebody if an act of violence is about to occur, um, keep themselves safer through that act. Um, let's see, talk to, and we'll go into children and safety planning, but talking to your children about your safety um, and, and talking to um, them, not only about keeping them safe, um, but maybe the, if they know like an act of violence is about to occur, having them, you know, and, you know when mommy and daddy are fighting, maybe you should go play with your friends outside or, or whatever, you know, and, and talking to them about 
safety and what that looks like as a whole. And it doesn't necessarily have to be safety in the context of when, when you know, somebody hits me, this is what you should do. It could just be general safety idea. Like, how do you keep yourself safe? Um, and talking about things like stranger danger and, you know, th those types of things. And it just getting that idea into kids' heads of, around safety and that they have a right to be safe is just is, is a great point because you never know when that information is going to be um, is going to be triggered on their mind and come up and hopefully if there's a violence occurring it, it'll occur then um, prepare an emergency bag that could be something to do um, thinking about emergency thinking about things that you maybe need to take into shelter um, I know that some people when I've talked to people have, have talked to me about like, oh, I just bought this, you know, Rachel Ray cooking set and I don't want to lose that. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I know that people are really attached to that Rachel Ray cooking set or whatever, but that's easily replaced in comparison to like a social security card um, or your birth certificates or things like that. So you want to talk about what are the important things? If you need to flee, if you need to leave, what things do you need with you? Do you need money? Do you need your forms of ID? Do you need medical records? Do you need information about bank accounts do you need again social security cards and birth certificates and things like that things that are really important to to think about when taking off because those things are really hard to replace and we don't want to have to put somebody through um just more of a struggle when trying to replace those items i guess um than, than they need to um creating a code word and sharing it with neighbors to alert them when violence occurs i know that i had um i was talking with I don't know, maybe two years ago, I, I presented at Pathways in Tula um, on, on this topic, and, and somebody had mentioned that they were previously in an abusive relationship, and um, one day their uh, neighbors had heard the, you know, the fight going on and, and, and whatever, and they had, when it was safe, they had approached her and said, hey, look, we know what's going on. We want to help. If you're ever in danger or if you need us to call the cops, uh, just go outside and yell orange and we'll be right there and we'll call the cops. Um, so things like that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, you know, whiskey, tango, echo, like, like an obscure phrase. It could be a phrase that something along the lines of maybe, you know, I'm taking the garbage out now or my, my kids want to come over and play with your kids. Is that okay? You know, things like that. Things that are um, a little more incognito, I guess, that doesn't seem as obscure to the abuser um so they're not automatically going to react or freak out or whatever um and, and thinking about that so um yeah is the survivor in a place of safety when their identity is accepted or rejected thinking about that um if and we're talking about a different identity let's take you know people who are transgender or uh, gender non-conforming and, and, and things like that. Are they available to, do they have supports and resources in in their community to get access to services? And so thinking about that, maybe you've got somebody who is, is transgender and their family doesn't accept them. Um, so do they have those options to maybe reach out and go stay with their parents? Do they have those options to go you know get emotional support from their you know their siblings maybe not and what is that going to look like for people how can we find a supportive services for people who aren't necessarily being accepted for themselves as they are by the people we would traditionally think would be accepting of them okay and so let's talk about this again like like i said i want to see some of the ideas that you have around safety in the home so if you would just type a few of those out and we'll and we'll talk about that Just go ahead and type in any answers, any thoughts, any ideas into the same field that we um, previously used, the, the question box. So are there anything else, anything that you can think of that also would be um, good to know, good to do um, while trying to um, increase safety while in the home? I know when we um, we're talking about preparing an emergency bag is um, sometimes people um, may not be able to prepare emergency bag or their previous emergency bag was was maybe found or discovered. So um, something that folks can do is, you know, think about how many of us have a, a bookshelf or a shelf of movies, right? Um, and maybe in one of those DVD cases or in one of those um, 
you know, books or folders or binders is that you actually have your important documents or information or the things that you need so that when you do have to go, when it's, you know, down to the wire and it's like, I, I need to leave now, is that you can literally grab that folder, grab that binder or grab that, you know, Spice World DVD case and just run out the, the door and it has all your stuff in it, right? It looks like we have a couple people that also chimed in. Um, oh, um, someone said to notify the schools that the kids are attending um, so that they are also aware of safety plans. Excellent, excellent. Um, someone else said, trust your gut. Um, you know, if something feels off, um, start calmly moving to an exit or a large window um, where you could possibly get out quickly. And that's actually interesting too, bringing up the windows. How many of us on this webinar, how many, um, you know, me and Sam <laughs> know how to get out of our windows, right? People are like, oh, well, I was a teenager, right? Well, look at the windows today versus the windows, you know, 15, 20 years ago, right? Um, me personally, I couldn't get through a window 15, 20 years ago. It was the hardest thing in the world, right? And now the screens and the windows are, are so complicated. Um, for example, in my house, I have like those triple pane windows. The landlord just updated them, um, but they have so many buttons and they flip out and they do all this stuff. I <laughs> I have trouble figuring out even how to open it so that my cat doesn't get up, you know. So think about that, maybe going through with a survivor and um, showing them how to open different windows and different screens. And then the last one that we got in is um, this person said that they encourage their clients to um, throw a chair or something through a window, um, leaving an exit or drawing attention outside. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, those are great. Yeah, those are great ideas, and thank you for throwing them out. And again, I mean, I, I like doing this too, and just having these conversations because it's stuff that maybe I haven't thought about. Um, it's not, like I never would have talked to people up until now about if you need to throw that chair through that window, it's because it's going to cause that you know, um, you know, reaction not only to maybe if you need to exit, but also to people who are outside potentially. So yeah, absolutely. I thank you for all of that. I appreciate it. Um, talking about a few things with the um, safety in the home continued um let's see some of this is already covered um if violence is occurring cover as much of the body as possible that's one thing that i talk about um it's it's a hard conversation to have with people um i know that it's uncomfortable to say hey i know you're going to get beaten later uh let's talk about this um but uh things that we talk about is if we know that an act of violence is about to occur we know it's going to happen um maybe getting into more of like a fetal position where you're you know, you've backed yourself up against a wall, you're on the ground covered, um, you've got um, your, you know, your hands like over your head, covering your head, you're bundled up and you're really trying to cover as much of the, um, you know, like vital parts of your body as possible. So you incur the least amount of damage um, and making spare keys and hiding them in case you need to flee quickly. Um, again, yeah, maybe that Spice World DVD case has some spare keys in it, and that's fine. Um, I know that this is, I mean, and all this stuff is easier said than done, and it's going to vary depending on the situation. Uh, like, for example, I know that replacing my house key, uh, okay, that's going to be two bucks if I need to, but replacing my car key is closer to 300. Um, maybe it's not easy, it's easy to do, but again, thinking about these ideas, um, with what people have and exploring those options um, could be super beneficial to people. Um, talking about safety with, with children, so we'll jump into the section. Um, teaching them how to call 911. Um, that's something, again, not necessarily that you have to have this conversation in the context of, hey, when, you know, daddy gets mad at mommy, this is what you should do, but really like just teaching them, you know, this is what 911 is, these are the police. Um, having those small conversations with them to just plug those ideas, they know, um, and they learn, I mean, they might learn this stuff in school as well, but knowing that you're teaching that and having those conversations with them um, is, is gonna be important. Um, you wanna direct them to safe places to go if the abuse begins to occur. I, I think I mentioned it earlier, um, maybe going to a neighbor's house or maybe going up to their room to do homework or something. Um, but we wanna remove the children from that scenario. We don't want them psychologically or physically being harmed by what's about to occur. Um, creating code words that indicate they should leave the area, doesn't have to be, 007, it could just be, you know, it's time to go to your homework now, or um, I'll call you when dinner's ready, or, you know, something, something like that, that just makes it so they know, okay, it's time to leave, they're going to be in a fight, let's just, let's stay away from the situation. Um, talking to them about how this is not their fault, this is super important, I can't remember off the top of my head, 
um, what the PSA is titled. So there's a PSA on YouTube regarding domestic violence where there is a child who the, the father enters into the scene um, and the child, for whatever reason, ends up spilling a bowl of cereal. Um, and then from that, that, that catalyst, um, the, the, the father ends up attacking the mother um, physically in, in the situation ends up hitting her and I think choking her maybe. Um, but, but thinking about, I mean, the PSA overall, it's, it, that's not the final message, but thinking about that in the, in the context of a child's mind, if they're five years old and they know that they spilled milk and as soon as they spilled milk, milk daddy hit mommy, um, that's gonna sit with them. That's gonna be something that is going to potentially hurt them um, in, in so many ways that uh, we would hopefully try to avoid. And so again, if, if they know this is going on, and then again, talk, I mean, I'm sure we all know this, but talking with parents who are going through this, kids are not stupid. They know what's going on. They know what abuse looks like. They, I mean, they, they know that stuff is happening. Um, so having this conversation, even if it's difficult to have, having with them and just talking to them, you know, I love you. This is not your fault. Um, this, I, you know, I, I want to support you. I want to keep you safe. Things like that. And really affirming that, that you love them and that you're there to support them is going to be beneficial. Um, tell them to never try to intervene if abuse is occurring. I know that I've gotten plenty of calls where uh, teenage sons and daughters, you know, see things. And even I've had calls where like kids were the, the parents just like, getting like young kids getting involved. Um, but yeah, teenage sons and daughters, they see that something's happening and they, you know, say, screw, I'm done. This isn't, you know, you, you cannot hurt this parent any longer. You cannot hurt this person anymore. And they, and they try to get involved. Um, it's just not a good thing. I mean, it's, it's going to be something that could potentially get them hurt. And we don't want to cause that to happen. Um, I know I actually just had a conversation with, with one of the volunteers for our link line. Who said, well, you know, why isn't that necessarily safer? If they if they have the power, if they're, you know, a you know, in seventeen year old high school, you know, jock football player, like, what if they can overpower the person? Well, even still, we we don't want to introduce more violence to stop violence. It just doesn't. It it could backfire. It doesn't make sense. It could get more people hurt. We just don't want to do that. Um, there, I mean, there are a number of things. It's like introducing. We have callers who will will ask about. You know, is it safer to get a taser or should I get a taser or should I go get a gun to protect myself? And what the caller does, I mean, again, it's ultimately up to them, but but talking about just statistically speaking and through the research that we know that if somebody's untrained with weapons, um, the likelihood of a weapon being used against them in an, an act of violence is pretty high. Um, and so we don't, so we just want to have those conversations with people. Um, yeah, enroll them in counseling if possible. I know that a lot of service providers have, um, free or low cost options for children's counseling and services, because it does, again, going back to ACEs, uh, it, it impacts them uh, for sure. Um, so if we can get people, you know, entered into those situations, and then if not possible, create a list of people with them that they feel comfort or comfortable talking to about their feelings. Um, this is also something that I like to talk to, not only with, um, if we get like teenage callers calling in, but with parents and adults and anybody, I mean, I just, I like to familiarize them with the uh, mandatory reporting laws. Um, of course, we absolutely encourage people, you know, reaching out and getting support um, if they're, if they need it, um, you know, emotionally, mentally, and, and what so not. But knowing that Utah is a mandatory reporting state and that if anybody is suspicious of child abuse, then they are legally obligated to contact either DCFS or law enforcement or they themselves could be subjected to a class B misdemeanor for not reporting the abuse. So talking about, we have people who ask, is it, is it good to talk to the school counselor? Can, can the kids do that? Well, I mean, if it's a person they trust and they want to talk to, I mean, yeah, I, that's totally fine, but this is what could also happen. And so just making people aware of that, that um, th those laws do exist to protect the children for a reason, um, but that could also open another can of worms that they're maybe not prepared for and we want to at least try to prepare for them and pre prepare that with them a little bit um talking more about you know if possible get the child a cell phone and create and customize a safety plan with them uh, of course we're all thinking yeah go get a child an iphone <laughs> like uh, I, I always laugh at this when i read this one but thinking about it also like i mentioned earlier you know south valley sanctuary and the why having burner phones and stuff maybe you could look into that maybe that's something to explore with um 
with the survivor that you're working with and saying, hey, I know this place has a phone. Maybe you can get this phone for your kid or even yourself, but for, for your kid and hide it in a, in, in a secure place. So if they need to, they can call and reach out, get help or you can call and get help or whatever if, if no other phones are available. Um, you want to avoid custody exchanges in the home or at the home. We just, we just don't want to do that. It's not safe as a whole. Um, I mean, it's not a universal statement that, you know, abusers are going to only abuse behind closed doors. Of course, they can be abusive in public, but, um, but a lot of the time that does happen, especially if somebody's worried about their reputation, you don't want to, you don't want to make yourself subjected to that. Um, so preferably in public places, um, you know, banks, potentially DCFS buildings, police departments, things that have natural surveillance and security that have cameras that people would maybe be a little or a lot more discouraged from acting on an intention of violence um, or abuse. Um, thinking about at the children's school as well. Um, and, and somebody mentioned earlier, and I, and I appreciate that, that informing the school about like what's going on with the situation, that's, that's fantastic. Um, but, but thinking about, for example, if you've got custody exchanges and you just want to avoid the person altogether, um, if you can get the custody to, let's say, for example, your one parent who drops the kid off, you know, on Friday morning at school, and then the other parent picks them up on Saturday or on Friday morning or Friday afternoon, excuse me, has them all weekend, drops them off at school on Monday morning, and then the first parent then picks them up again on Monday afternoon. There's no interaction there. They are getting to school. They're having those, you know, whatever they need to do. You're 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 following and abiding by the custody laws, but you don't have to have any face-to-face -face interaction with the individuals. Um, and with a friend or family member, so the survivor is not alone. I do talk to people about this though, um, that thinking about who you're introducing to the situation or the scenario, because um, of course um, you've got maybe you've entered a new relationship and you have a new partner um, and you feel safe with that partner and you feel like they would be able to protect you if something happens. Okay. I mean, that's, that's fine and dandy. Um, but let's think about if the abusive partner, the ex abusive partner um, is, you know, is violently or constantly jealous, um, is, is stalking, has made threats to the new partner in the past. Um, is it really the safest option to bring them along and have that confrontation or should you maybe find somebody else to do that? Um, so just thinking about like what those dynamics look like with people and, and having those discussions. Um, before we get into pets, let's talk about this too. Are there any other ideas around children's safety that, that you all have that could be of benefit to this conversation? Um, yeah, if you have anything that you wanna add or anything that um, you maybe have experienced that has worked or um, any other ideas, go ahead and type those um, into the question box. And um, also with the police departments, um, many um, you know police departments have these safe um, trade-off zones where um, they are for things like custody or if you buy a Nintendo DS or something on you know Craigslist that you can go to this specific place and exchange that there um, where you're you know within sight of the law enforcement and of course with all those um, cameras so um, that could be really beneficial and of course if you're working with a survivor who is undocumented um, that may not be an option that may um, be um, something that um, they want to avoid or something that may increase their um, their danger too so um, be aware of that All right, Sam, I think you may have may have covered everything. Um, <laughs> of course, yeah. absolutely thorough. Um, Everyone's but, like, you got this, Sam. <laughs> that was, and that's totally cool. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, thinking about this again, like how can we how can we safety plan around children and, and all that? Um, so safety with pets, because this is a big one. I mean, I know that everybody I in the beginning, I think that Andy and I both were talking about our fur babies and how much we love them. Um, so, that, I mean, this is a big thing. You can't expect people to just want to leave their pets at home, um, particularly when you know that it's a violent home. Um, so thinking about that, we try not to leave pets alone with the abusive partner, if, if at all possible. It's, I mean, again, it's easier said than done. If you have a job and you have no option but to leave, um, you, you sometimes you got to give. But if, if you can, you know, if you're fleeing a situation, trying to find different options for uh, services that you can take them to uh, is going to be a benefit. 
um, you want to gather all necessary paperwork for pets. Um, I, I'd never really had pets before that I needed to get registration for until I got Ruby. Um, and I didn't realize how much, like, how, how valuable my, you know, my, my vet bills, or my, yeah, my vet bills and, and statements have been and how much of my, her, you know, microchip stuff is a value to me and how much the um, registration, like, I, I want to hold on to that stuff because it's going to be a pain in the butt to replace potentially and also um, could lead to maybe lack of lack of options if you can't verify that they've that they don't have or that they've had like all their vaccines or whatever, um, or that you can't verify that they're your pet because they're not registered or it doesn't look like they're registered and, and all that stuff. Um, maybe talking to the family, friends, or vet about temporary care of planning to leave. Um, that's I mean that's kind of as far as things that I've looked up. That's kind of universally those conversations to have like hey can we leave this with you for a couple of days or a couple of weeks or um, talking to your vet, yeah, this is what the situation is, and I need to leave. And is there any option that we can have to to keep um, my, you know, my pet in a place of safety while I'm going through this? Um, some options for people, uh, as far as it, particularly in Utah, um, some of the things that I talk about frequently on the hotline, you know, contacting various other local providers. Um, the Purple Paws Project up in the Park City area through Nuzzles and Company, they're fantastic. Um, they basically, they take on, you know, cats and dogs, um, who, for people who are leaving abusive situations, um, they do require that the, the dog or the cat is spayed or neutered. And if they are not, um, they will spay or neuter them to have them there. Um, but, but it, I mean, but it's a great option. I know that with that, they, they need to work with a domestic violence service provider to verify that this is, you know, that the situation is legitimate and they do need to get the, the pet into safety. And it's really just to minimize any harm to the, the Nuzzle and Company and Purple Paws staff up there. Um, so just knowing that you have to connect with service providers to get this um, pets into safety. Uh, Humane Societies, uh, the Diggity Dog Resort in Salt Lake has been helpful. Um, one thing to note, particularly for the Alabama caller here, um, or webinar attendee, is that the National Domestic Violence Hotline website, if you go to their website, they have, uh, I, I mean, I guess like a semi-interactive map of the, the, the whole U.S. Um, that you can go through and click on the state, and it'll show you all the places in the state that will help with um, pet housing um, to get your, your pet into a place of safety if you need to leave. Um, but also thinking sometimes too, um, that this isn't always the easiest option. I mean, cause we, if you know what animals are required as far as like legally required, um, to be allowed into spaces, it's, it's not support animals. It's only service animals. They have to be trained to do a specific task because somebody can't physically do it themselves, such as, um, you know, helping them if somebody's epileptic, epileptic and they have seizures or, um, a pet that's trained to, alert them if there's like a fire that goes on or something like that um, and they can't see it or they can't hear the fire alarm and you know things like that they have to be trained specifically for a task um, those animals are only dogs and miniature horses <laughs> um, surprisingly so knowing that they have to have been trained for a specific task it can't just be a support animal some places can be nice I know I've heard of domestic violence service providers maybe temporarily taking in a small animal when the person comes in, but it's not something to bank on. Um, and also noting that it's not always the easiest thing. If you've got like 10 horses or something, um, there's not really options in Utah to store your 10 horses in different places. Um, there's not really an option to, for example, my grandma has like 16 birds. There's not an option in Utah to store my grandma's 16 birds if she were to flee a domestic violence situation. Um, so, so noting that those could be some barriers and dynamics to people, um, leaving with their pets. Um, and then yeah, just type in, if you have any other ideas around pets that I haven't mentioned, this is sort of, sort of a shorter list, but please feel free to type those out real quick, um, to generate more conversation. Yeah. If you have any other, um, ideas or any other, um, thoughts on how to keep, um, animals safe or include, um, animals in your safety plan, go ahead and type those in that question box. And um, similar to what, um, or what, uh, to elaborate a little bit on what Sam was saying, especially with like horses, is that sometimes you'll be able to find a private stable, um, but that could be really difficult, especially on depending on where you live. Um, 
And you know, if you if that domestic violence service provider has that um, connection. And in certain areas and um, counties, you actually have to license cats too. So depending on your where you are, um, it could be beneficial to know if you do have to license um, your cats and not just your dogs. Anything else? You know what, Sam? I think we are rocking this. Cool. I, think, I don't know if we're rocking this. So. No, that's cool. We'll just move forward then. Um, so some safety ideas around leaving um, and when to leave, you know, if possible, leave when the partner is not home. Um, I do not advise anybody to, you know, the partner is in the living room on the couch, you know, you walk out to flip them off and say, screw you, I'm leaving. That's probably not the safest idea. Um, it's going to be to to just avoid any contact or any, um, you know, tumultuous type of situation, just to leave when the person's not around. And this is including, you know, um, getting items from the home when the person isn't there, um, you know, stuff like that, if, if that option is available. Um, you know, pack a bag ahead of time, I mentioned this earlier, and keep it in a secure location. That might not look like a bag, as Andy had pointed out. Um, it might look like a DVD case or, um, you know, something, something along those lines, but packing something that has priority items that you're going to need to include. Um, have a plan of where to go and how you will get there. Um, such as a shelter, family, or friend's house. Um, this is this is one to think about. I mean, I anybody who works in uh, you know a domestic violence service provider type of agency, I'm sure you've taken a call uh, where somebody is saying, "Hey, I'm coming in right now. I've left. Uh, I'll be there in a couple of minutes," and you're left maybe potentially with the awkward conversation of saying, "We don't have space. Like we can't we can't take you in." Um, and then, I mean, where does that leave an individual? They now have left, you know, potentially, and they don't want to go back. But if their choice is between, you know, homelessness and going back, I mean, what what are they potentially going to choose? And then also noting that they've left, um, and maybe it was a particularly nasty fight or something like that. Um, the person, the abusive partner, could be riled up still, um, and it could be unsafe for them to go back. And so, if at all possible, having that future conversation with individuals and saying, hey just as a heads up, you've got to prepare for this. Um, you've got to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row with this. Um, and you and it can be like a smooth kind of transition or as smooth as possible anyway, um, because there's not there are not a ton of options in, in Utah. I know that we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, but there are, you know, there are only 15, um, you know, domestic violence service providers in the state. And that's, that's not a ton um, at all. I mean, compared to different states like in, in Texas or California that have, you know, many, many, many more than 15. Um, it's it's something to think about and something to have a conversation with them about. Um, have a plan of where to go and how you will get there. Oh yeah, I just said that. Um, tell only your trusted people your plan. And this is one thing to, I, I don't mean to get like an, like an uber paranoid soapbox about this, but really thinking about what a trusted person means um, is, is important. So for example, um, maybe, maybe you tell your kid um, that you're going to go, you and them, you know, are going to go stay with a grandma and grandpa for a couple of weeks, um, you know, and it's, you try to keep it hush hush, hush hush or whatever, but then knowing that the, the child has a relationship with the abusive partner, and maybe they mention, you know, hey, we're, you know, we're, they said that we're going to go stay with grandma and grandpa this weekend or, or whatever, and so then that might alert the abusive partner of the plans. Um, just, just noting that again, like you, you have to be really careful about who you say what to, because you never know who is going to say what information that could lead to identifying where you're at or what your plans are or, um, what, what you think you might do. So just, just having that conversation with people that you may love them. Absolutely. But is this wise to tell them this information at this time? Um, at least until you're safe, you know, it could be. Could be a good combo to have. Um, and yeah, alert trusted people about the situation. I know that somebody, yeah, again, mentioned earlier, the children's school, if you've got like a protective order or something like that, your work um, or your school, if you're if you're on campus, letting, you know, campus police know and, you know, things like that. Um, telling family, friends, or neighbors, if, if that's an option. Um, maybe you've got a really close community who can kind of form a little bit of a community watch for you there. Um, or maybe all the neighbors are super best friends with the abusive partner. Um, thinking about that as an option, um, or maybe not an option, could be something to to consider there. Um, let's see, keeping evidence of the abuse. Um, that's that's something super super important. We'll talk maybe more in a, in a little bit 
um, about stocking logs and, and what that looks like. Um, but but making sure that you're you're documenting it via pictures, um, saving emails, voicemails, text messages, um, things like that, that that could be of evidence in getting a protective order or um, helping uh, build a case against a person if there's if there's criminal or not criminal um, police involvement and you're and you're in the court system. I'm saving up money if possible. That's a lot easier said than done. Um, but thinking about as as an advocate or as just a community member, like what resources and options you might know of that can be of benefit to somebody. So for example, this grocery bag story, um, we had uh, a former colleague who, when she used to do this presentation, she'd explain that she, she worked with a, a victim who was in an absolutely completely controlling abusive relationship. Um, to the point where the abusive partner was going to the grocery stores um, and taking down and documenting the exact cost of every item. Um, so when they would send the victim to the grocery store, they knew what the exact cost was. And so if they were over by anything or they were under by anything, um, it, you know, it was it was a world of hurt to come to them. Um, and so this was going on for a while. And <clears throat> after a while, of this sort of pattern the, the the survivor in the scenario um, ended up actually discovering that the grocery store that she was sent to, they had a, a recycling program set up that if you returned one bag, one plastic bag to the grocery store, you'd get one penny. So this woman, like bless her heart, would take back these grocery bags a penny at a time, a penny at a time, a penny at a time, and ended up saving up enough money to get a Greyhound ticket to get back to her family um, at a different part of the state. And so, I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, talking about resilience and patience and strengths and, and ideas, uh, thinking about, again, though, what ideas, what apps do you know of that could save money? What, um, yeah, what, what recycling programs do you know of? Um, those types of things. What do you know that can maybe um, help people gain money in a way that's not so obvious to an abusive partner? Um, making sure the car always has gas if possible. Um, you don't want to be in your car and realize, like me, and I do it often, that you only have 25 miles left in your tank. Um, thinking about particularly if this person, if you're in rural Utah somewhere, if you're in rural any part of the country, um, and you don't know where any gas stations are going to be and you're on empty, like how far are you really going to get? Um, so noting that, try to keep it, the, the gas tank full. And then also uh, people have mentioned... Um, if, if possible, start backing your car in to the driveway rather than um, pulling in as, as one would usually do. Um, it may only save a couple of seconds, but that could be a, a couple of seconds that saves someone's life. Um, so consider that as an option. Um, changing locks, getting a security, a security system or a large dog. <clears throat> um, again, easier said than done, but there are options for this. Uh, potentially, I don't know how many familiar um, at least in Utah, um, with the with the crime victims reparations, and so basically, it's if you go through the Office for Victims of Crime, there is an application that you can fill out that if you are a victim of crime, um, you are potentially able to get financial reparations for the the crime you've been subjected to. And this is different from um, restitution. Restitution is within the court process, and so like a judge can order somebody to pay a restitution for a crime. This is a separate pot of money. Um, so, th and there's a whole list. If you go to the, the OVC website, um, the application is on like the front page. You can go on the right hand side and find the, the application in English or Spanish, I believe. Um, but there are a number of things. This could be um, potentially, this could be security systems, this could be um, medical bills, this could be therapy, this could be funeral expenses. Um, if the, the victim died and you have maybe like dependence um, from, the, from the victim, um, if they died because of the abuse that they had been subjected to. Um, this could be uh, relocation expenses, things like that. So just knowing that those options are available um, to, to look into. And like I said, it's crime victims reparations for anybody who um, wants to know. So alerting neighbors, again, is safe to do so. And then consider getting a different vehicle. Again, you know, like I, I laugh at this one too, because it's like, just go buy a new car. It's fine. Because obviously all of us particularly social workers and, and people in this field have just the option to go buy a car, let alone people who are maybe broke and dealing with and don't have any, you know, any money or financial options. But if possible, switching out a car, I know that um, there are a few people that I'm aware of who like switch out their cars every year for whatever reason um, and just stay like on this continued lease thing or whatever. Um, <clears throat> not always easy um, and it's maybe not an option that they want to pursue, but it's something to think about because um, a car, if it's 
a you know a car that the person's familiar with has a bunch of you know save the whale bumper stickers on that Prius, um, then it's maybe pretty identifiable to the to the person who's uh, perpetrating abuse. And so thinking about hey maybe I should ditch this thing and um, and stay safer. Um, let's see changing daily routines, routes to and from home, grocery stores, etc. I know I'm particularly um, close to the the Smith that's right around the corner from me. Um, but if I need to, if it's going to keep me safe, I will maybe go to the one that's you know a mile, an extra mile away. Um, get a PO box instead of having an address listed. This is um, unfortunately in Utah, they don't have an address confidentiality program. I don't know about Alabama. I know a bunch of other states do, um, but Utah does not, unfortunately. So thinking about PO boxes as an option, particularly in rural Utah, um, could be a better option for people because they might be of no cost. But if you're dealing with maybe more urban settings, there could be a fee attached to them, um, like a monthly fee of, I don't know, maybe like $12 or something, depending on the size of the PO box. Um, but thinking about that, maybe it's good to have that as an option, um, but maybe they can't afford it. And so what, what ideas can you do to maybe hide your address and, and, and wipe those from internet searches or, or whatever? Um, get an unlisted phone number. Uh, thinking about that as an option and then change passwords and personal accounts. Um, having that um, second, the, the, the two step identif or verification process, um, at putting PIN numbers on accounts that only you know about, um, things that just add that extra level of safety to something so they're not easily broken into. Uh, let's see, and then for the sake of time, we'll just jump into emotional safety planning. So you want to seek out supportive people, um, just anybody that you know of. What we talk about in social work, the, you know, humans are inherently social beings, and we want to connect them back to community members, whatever that looks like. It could be people that are family and friends. It could be um, churches or other support groups or you know, special interest groups or whatever, um, but getting people connected to other people is, is a wonderful thing. Um, you want to create a safe space to process emotions, whatever that looks like. Maybe that's just the one time that you're allowed to have a bath in a day um, and that, you know, you at least have 15 minutes to, you know, decompress and relax and try to process what's going on. Um, cultivating self-care tactics um, such as yoga, meditation, walking, talking to a friend, therapist, all forms of exercise. Um, Andy was going on about how their self-care is Dungeons and Dragons and those miniatures and stuff. And and painting and playing and all that. And that's fantastic. I mean, whatever that looks like for you or the individual um, is, is totally fine. Um, you want to discuss what the survivor is already doing to attend to their emotional safety. Maybe they have got, you know, a great emotional safety plan um, and they're cultivating those self-care tactics. That's great, um, but maybe they don't. And so we want to have that conversation with them and see what that looks like. And then also remember to remind the survivor to be kind to themselves. I don't know how many times I've had calls where people are just beating themselves up that they're so stupid and they're worthless and they deserve this. And it's, I mean, absolutely no. I mean, first off, they're totally wrong. But secondly, it's, it's I mean, we just want to say, you know, you're, you're brave, you're wonderful. This doesn't deserve to happen to you. And we, we want to make sure that they know that and that, that we're in their corner and we're supporting them. And we want to try to boost their confidence because we might be the only person in their life that's doing so. Um, and we want to help teach them how to do that for themselves. Um, and so working with this, you know, what safety planning with marginalized communities can look like. And then I don't know if anybody, all of you have any ideas around this, but often marginalized individuals face extra barriers when seeking safety. Um, talking about, again, what maybe LGBT or trans folk are facing um, as far as family support or what immigrants and, and uh, non-documented citizens, what they might face as far as like getting law enforcement involved and stuff like that. Um, if anybody has any ideas, let's just plug them in real quick as far as looking with any vulnerable or marginalized community, what are some barriers that they might face when trying to seek safety and, and potentially, you know, how could we help them? All right, everyone just um, type into that question box. Um, what are some barriers um, to safety planning that marginalized identities, um, such as LGBTQIA folks, um, undocumented folks, um, Native survivors, what they might um, face when, when trying to increase their safety. So, um, someone uh, typed in, um, they may not have a strong support system. Yeah, a couple folks actually um, just typed that in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
and this could be for you know all of these 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 groups you know think plural families you maybe don't feel comfortable talking to you know the the other the, the kids or the sister wives or anything like that or lgbtq folk or um indigenous communities if, and if you're in you know salt lake city you're maybe not connected so closely to your um your your tribal community or your spiritual traditions and stuff and so that could be absolutely a um, a barrier for sure And with all of this, I mean, just noting that this is something, I mean, this is really something to think about is that we've got our experiences that we go through and the, the, the lens that we see, you know, life through and, and all that stuff. And it's going to be vastly different to somebody who, if you're not a person of color, they are a person, a person of color. Or if you, if they are, you know, trans or, you know, gay or whatever, um, and you're not, their lived experience is going to be different than your lived experience and maybe the trauma associated around that isn't going to make sense to you necessarily um but we need to find ways to potentially get them connected to resources and support services that are familiar with those traumas and are familiar with those identities um, and the additional barriers that they would face uh, because it will be important to seeking their safety and um getting them to you know the safest possible place in whatever situation they're trying to be in okay all right and so we'll just jump through this last little bit here with safety planning around technology um there are definitely more comprehensive um presentations that we can do around um tech abuse and tech, tech safety um in in the future but but just knowing some ideas around just like what that could look like um some examples of tech abuse and safety planning here, you know, unwanted or repeat calls or text messages, uh, breaking into someone's social networking accounts, pressure to share embarrassing or private pictures or videos, um, posting nude photos without consent, breaking into email, intercepting Wi-Fi signals. I mean, this is just like the, the tip of the tip of the iceberg here. There, it's, I, my, my parents got a, uh, a new, you know, smart washer and dryer. And I just, I kind of lost it when they told me, I'm like, what, you can connect to the internet and then everybody's gonna hack into your washer and dryer and you're susceptible to abuse. And they're like, yeah, I'm calm down. <laughs> but really though, I mean, you never know, like with, with technology and how wildly, you know, like vast it is and how quickly it's growing, uh, it's, it's easy to misuse. If you can find a loophole in it, a lot of the times the people who are abusing technology are, you know, 10 steps ahead of the people who are trying to protect against those abuses. Um, so noting that um, tech safety and thinking about like what, what technology is in the home and what technology people use in their day to day lives um, and what vulnerabilities those have are gonna be important. Um, different devices, looking at computers, cell phones, social media, email, cordless phones. I mean, this is almost, this is almost fairly out of date here because if you think, you know, you're you know, have a smart microwave or a smart refrigerator or a smart washing machine or a smart toothbrush. Um, I mean, there, there's so many different possibilities for technology um, to be utilized um, to, to abuse somebody. I mean, I think that one, one big one that people are super jazzed on with are those the Echoes and the Alexa devices and stuff like that. But thinking about that as victim advocates in terms of confidentiality, I know that I can't take a phone call in a room with an Alexa that's, that's functioning or working because it's constantly recording my conversation. And I, for some reason, heaven forbid, somebody were to use that against a victim that I'm trying to assist, I mean, that would just break my heart. Um, and it sounds so far-fetched, but I mean, really think about it though, the truth, particularly when tech abuse is involved, truth is by far stranger than fiction. Um, let's see here. So common ways to use, or technology is used by abusive partners. Um, GPS tracking, sharing locations on phones, um, attaching, you know, GPS trackers to people's cars, downloading apps, that's apps that are tracking people, um, keystroke logging hardware. So I know that a lot of the websites have like a safety exit um, that, hey, don't go any further if you think that this computer is being tracked. Um, but if you've got keystroke logging software on there, it's, you're going to see like what was typed in regardless. Um, hacking into cell phones, email and social media, um, super easy to do. Um, excessive texting, emailing, or calling. I think that a lot of people overlook the idea that um, that's like cyber abuse and tech abuse. I mean, it's illegal. It's, it's an actual like cyber stalking is a crime. Um, so noting that that could be something to consider um, looking into with legal assistance or through the police. Um, intercepting Wi-Fi signals. I know that I had um, a caller one time who their abusive partner was in California and they were in Utah and the, the abusive partner was able to hack into their Wi-Fi from California 
to see what was going on in their day-to-day life and um it was just and they couldn't prove it to the police because the police were unfamiliar with it and so they they were kind of stumped and at a loss as to what to do um to help get support for them um ways for survivors to stay safe while using technologies um different things you know purchasing a prepaid cell phone check the cell phone to see if the parental monitoring on their account has been activated um, change passwords or email on social media sites um, not you know, your pet's name and your year of birth those get good, good passwords <laughs> um, check cell phone for any unknown apps um, and I mean even if that means opening every single app and seeing what they all do um, looking into that they turn off GPS or put the phone in airplane mode maybe when going into shelters um, could be a good idea if they feel like they're being monitored um, check the computer for any unknown new or external devices um, that could be attached or installed or downloaded or whatever um, and with this you know you want to assess the technology that what that's in the survivor's life again having that conversation with them um, about what what they have around them and how it can be compromised to the best of your knowledge and just being familiar with the devices you own has been super beneficial to me at least in having these conversations with people um, you want to always keep safety in mind getting a new phone or not using the compromised device might not be an option um, maybe it's safer to have that GPS monitoring on because they at least know the survivor knows that the person is watching them and they can plan around that. Um, and then document incidents, discuss creating a stalking log, explain how to save emails and text messages, things like that. Um, a stalking log is, is legit, just like this is what incident happened at this time, this is who saw it, you know, this is how it made me feel. And, and documenting that, particularly if you're trying to get a protective order or a stalking injunction or things along those lines um and then just as a whole to wrap this up here talking about some general resources um as far as domestic violence victim services it's you know they're safe places for victims and their children they're available 24 hours a day seven days a week there are 15 in the state of utah currently um, and the various services they provide emergency shelter advocacy services for both domestic violence and sexual assault case management, counseling, support groups, transitional housing, rape crisis response, children's services, food, personal care items, and potentially referrals to other agencies. Because again, we're, we're all in this together. Um, very uh, it's a high school musical there, but, um, but we are. Um, and it's, it's very important to know that we can lean on each other for support services if we're hitting a roadblock and potentially trying to get a person to safety um, for them, you know, themselves and family, friends, all that. Um, knowing that the National Domestic Violence Hotline exists and you can reach out to that, they are 24 seven and they have access to more than 200 languages. Um, they're available through phone and chat services um, to anyone in the US. So knowing that if people aren't comfortable making a phone call, there are chat services and I believe there are text services as well. And they have access to, I think that they're connected the the loveisrespect.org for teens and teen dating, dating violence. You can look into that. They have a text service as well. Their number is 1-800-799-7233. Um, and I've talked a little bit about the Domestic Violence Link Line, the statewide crisis hotline for Utah. It's information and referrals for individuals um, experiencing domestic violence, crisis intervention, and general safety planning. Um, it's available 24 seven. We have access to up to 150 languages, the interpreter services. Um, and noting here that it's not a counseling service. Um, we cannot meet with individuals in person. Our goal is to assess a situation and get them connected to the right resources based on whatever abuses they are facing. Um, that number there is 1-800-897-5465. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns regarding the link line, please feel free to reach out to me, as that is my baby over at the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition. I am more than happy to assist navigating that, explaining it, or, or troubleshooting if something comes up. Um, you can find us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, um, or through the udvc.org um, just website link there. Um, oh, and Andy, we went over this already, um, and I think that we are good to go with this. So thank you so much for being here, everybody. I appreciate you letting me capitalize upon your time. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to assist. Awesome. Um, thank you, Sam. If, if anyone has any last minute questions, um, type them into the question box and we can get them um, answered um, really quickly. And if not, you have my information right there on the slide and also Sam's um, information um, will be available as well. Um, yeah, any questions? Just type those into that question box.
Okay. So a question just came in. A safety plan doesn't need to be done every time we meet, right? Um, just looked over um, and updated if need be. Sure, that, that's a great question. And I would say that the answer to that is yes. I mean, if you've done, a, I think checking back in on like, hey, have you followed through on these options is, is a good idea. But and, and like I said in the beginning of this, it's not something that you need to necessarily do like every single time in transition. Okay, here we go into a safety plan. It's something, it's just a, for me, it's just a conversation, an ongoing conversation. And I utilize it when necessary to make sure that if there's updated information about a survivor situation, that I can maybe help prepare them for the safest possible way to navigate that. So yeah, no, if, I mean, if it's something that you've already covered or gone over um, and you know that they've got a plan, you don't need to be redundant about it necessarily, unless of course that's important. It's just something to do and to know that safety planning is, is more of a verb than anything. <laughs> um, and and that it's, it's something that we can actively use when necessary. Um. Okay, so another question came in is, I may have missed it, but do we um, need to go through every section of the safety plan, um, a safety plan, even if it doesn't apply? Sure, and that, that's also, thank you for that question. Um, I think that again, like assessing the caller, well, I guess the caller in my situation, but you might be meeting with them in person. Um, if, it's, if it's something that's irrelevant, if it seems like it's not applicable to their situation, um, don't don't worry about it. We want to just figure out, okay, what are the goals that are important to the person that we're working with, and how can we safety plan around that? I mean, of course, if we think of like a brilliant idea that we want to just plug in real quick, like, hey, I know we didn't discuss this, but I thought about this as a potentially useful idea. That's fantastic. But yeah, no, I mean, if it's something that's not necessarily relevant to them, um, then don't worry about it. Um, if they're again, if if they're looking to get a protective order, I'm not going to necessarily, you know, spend 20 minutes discussing what safety in a shelter looks like if that's just something that doesn't work for them. I mean, it could be a later conversation to have if their situation changes, but it's not something that I need to do in that moment. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. All right. If anyone else has any more questions. Um... All right, and thank you. Thank you for thanking us, or you're welcome. There we go. Um, <laughs> I was like, wait, how do I do that? Um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much, Sam. That was excellent information. Um, I know I learned a lot, and um, hopefully all the folks that attended um, the webinar also learned a lot. And I will be sending out a copy of this um, presentation um, to y'all um, after the webinar. So we'd love to see you back at the next webinar in a couple weeks. We're gonna go over gender socialization. And have an excellent day. And again, thank you for attending. Bye, bye everyone. <laughs>